welcome to season two of The Foyer. First, as we begin the second season, I want to thank everyone for listening who's made season one such a great success. I began The Foyer several months ago, mostly as a just kind of stopgap project in the middle of COVID to replace the on-campus events that, that we couldn't have. But we've had such a great and, and positive reaction from people who've listened, not only all around the state of Utah, but all around the, the world, literally, uh, that we decided to, to keep going. And so uh, thank you for all of you for listening in. And of course, thank you to, to all of my incredible guests who have come on and, and made our conversation so rich. So we have a, a full slate of episodes lined up for this fall. Uh, let me announce a couple of them. On Tuesday, October 26th, we'll be discussing those two things you're not supposed to talk about, uh, religion and politics. Uh, I'll, be judge, I'll, I'll be joined by Judge Thomas Griffith, who recently retired from the DC Circuit, Circuit of Appeals, which is the sec, second highest court in the United States, uh, as well as Jennifer Walker Thomas, who's a board member of Mormon Women for Ethical Government. So I'm excited for that. Then three weeks later on Tuesday, November 16th, I'll be joined by authors Blair Ostler and Taylor Petrie, to talk about their new books, both of which deal in different ways with questions surrounding Mormonism and the LGBTQ community. Both of those episodes will be recorded at 7 p.m. Mountain, and you'll be able to join us as part of the live audience if you so choose. And of course, we always release our episodes uh, as podcasts for you to listen to later. But let's let the morrow take care of itself and focus our attention on today's topic and guests. There are some books that you read that simply change the way that you see the world, and then you want everybody you know to read those books. That was my experience reading the recent memoirs by Charles Inouye and Melissa Inouye, who just happened to be uncle and niece. Uh, I'll be honest, these are two of the most remarkable Mormon books I've ever read. We're in something of a golden age of Mormon intellectual life and cultural production, and even amidst all of the rich array of offerings that there are to read or to see or to watch, uh, these two books stand out in, in my mind. I was riveted from start to finish. So let me introduce each of them in turn and then we'll dive in. So Dr. Charles Inouye is the author of the provocatively titled memoir, Zion, Earth, Zen, Sky. And maybe, maybe we'll ask him to explain what that uh, title means. It was published this summer by the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. Educated at Stanford, uh, Kobe Daigaku in Japan and Harvard, he's a professor of Japanese literature at Tufts University, where he studies pre-modern and modern Japanese literature. And then I'm also joined by Dr. Melissa Weitzing Inouye, who is the author of the wonderfully titled Crossings, a bald Asian American Latter-day Saint woman scholars ventures through life, death, cancer, and motherhood, not necessarily in that order. Clearly, she was inspired by those long 19th century titles uh, that <laughs> went on and on and on. Having earned both her bachelor's and doctoral degrees from Harvard, she is a senior lecturer in Chinese studies at the University of Auckland and a historian in the LDS Church History Department. Uh, so Charles and Melissa, uh, welcome to the foyer. Thanks for having us. Thanks. You bet. Yeah. So, so I've just read, I mean, very brief professional bios, but, but I wonder if you do a little bit more to introduce yourself uh, to, to our listeners and maybe starting with your, your longer family story, which especially Charles, you, you talk about uh, at some length, uh, well, both of you refer to in your books. Uh, Charles, you open your book with the story of your parents and how the Inouye family came to Utah. Uh, mm -hmm. And eventually, uh, uh, many of you became Latter Day Saints. So, so do you mind starting with that story, Charles? And then each of you can maybe talk a little bit about, you know, how you became you through your various personal and professional journeys. Well, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to to talk with you this morning. Um, my family ended up uh, in Utah uh, after. Uh, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, and um, my family, my mother was living in Washington State, my father was living in California, and they were sent to the same 
uh, relocation camp in Wyoming near Cody. It's called Heart Mountain. And uh, after the war was over, they uh, they moved south to uh, Sigurd, Utah, and they lived on a farm just west of Sigurd, a couple miles. And um, they were uh, Pure Land Buddhists, but they did want their children to have some sort of spiritual training. And and the the temple was in Salt Lake, over two hours away. So. You know, a, a, a second best effort, they uh, took us to the church in Sigurd. They dress us up and throw us in the station wagon and dr drop us off and come back two, two hours later and take us home. So if you want to historicize, <laughs> historicize uh, the, the process, that's basically what happened. Yeah. And, and what was it like for them? Uh, b because if I remember from your book that, um, that the children joined the LDS church before your parents did. That's right. right. And so what was that like for them? Because they, they still held on um, uh, for, for, for many years uh, to, and, and, and to, to, to their uh, Buddhist traditions, even as their children became baptized in this other church. Uh, so how did that, what, what did that look like? And, and in a lot of ways, that's the story of your book, too, right. uh, well, the way that these two traditions come together. Exactly. My, my father told me that he never dreamed that his children would take to Mormonism. <laughs> and he was <clears throat> surprised, shocked, uh, concerned that, that in fact, we, we did one by one, you know, we got baptized and we went on missions and and so on um my my parents eventually did join the church when i was on my mission um but i think the first real experience that they had with with uh, the church was when my my sister charlotte died of leukemia uh, we were she was a downwinder she uh probably was was killed by the radioactive dust that the wind blew into the valley and um <clears throat> the the saints in sigurd offered the use of the chapel for the funeral and and at that funeral or so my mother told me um she felt the spirit so strongly that it kind of uh, changed her view of everything she felt god's love and she knew that she would someday see her daughter again but she didn't rush to join the church out of respect for my my grandfather and my grandmother who were pure land buddhists turns out that many years later when they finally did ask him my grandfather if it would be okay if they uh joined the church he had absolutely no reservations. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Melissa, uh, what about you? I mean, you you tell obviously you come uh, from the same in a way line. Your your father is is Charles's brother, but you also your your mother was Chinese American, right? And and so you have a, a, another uh, history that that contributes to to who you are. Do you want to tell some of that story? Yeah, actually, um, my very oldest relatives, my great grandfather and great grandmother, uh, came right here to Salt Lake City when they first came to America, and they from farmed, China, uh huh, uh, yeah. from the southern part of China, and they farmed celery around uh, twenty one hundred south and four hundred east in Salt Lake City, and by chance they became friends with this local family, the Soderborgs, who. Uh, and they had a very close kind of family relationship. So the Soderborg daughters uh, babysat the Jew family kids who were who were a little younger than the Soderborgs. And the Soderborgs boys worked on my great grandpa's farm and that's how they paid for their missions. Mm -hmm. And they had this kind of what they call the symbiotic relationship. So during the um, 
wartime era when uh, things were rationed, for example, they would kind of trade off the things that they liked and didn't like. Um, they had a cow that um, my great grandfather bought, but he didn't like to milk. So the Soderborg boys milked the cow for him and kept the cream. So um, they, they just had this kind of great interaction. And actually recently at the recent Mormon History Association meeting, I was, this guy was serving lunch and I said, hey, Soderborg, you wouldn't have to know. And it was the Soderborg descendants. And so we recently had this little reunion um, where my, my grandma, who, who, who was a kid at the time, you know, and, and the Soderborg descendants got together and it was a really fun party. Oh, that's terrific. So, um, so how, I mean, both of you have had, you know, such interesting careers, uh, it, Charles, in terms of uh, pursuing uh, Japanese literature, uh, Melissa, you've become a, a, a scholar of uh, Chinese history and cultures and, and global Christianities. Uh, and so you've both spent time in East Asia uh, and, and of course now you live here in, in, in the United States. How, how has that, you know, sort of intercultural, you know, very, you know, trans-Pacific global worldview. Uh, I mean, it, it seems to be part of both your identity as, as people, uh, as, as well as the, the kind of scholarly work that, that, that you do. Um, I mean, do you think of yourself as global citizens? I mean, is, is that a, a, a conscious identity uh, for you? Uh, maybe, Melissa, we'll start with you. Um. Well, as you know, both Uncle Charles and I are, 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 you know, we're both born in the United States. And so I think we've both gone through this process of having to kind of discover East Asian culture and, yeah. and to, to learn about it and to become slightly competent in it. And um, even, you know, today, I, I don't, I wouldn't dare to call myself fluent in Chinese because it's such a, you know, difficult language to speak really well. <laughs> And you picked it up on your mission first. Right? I, I studied at Harvard, and then I, I then I yeah. also practiced a lot on my mission and learned a lot more. Um, so, so I'm a really American person, I guess is what I'm saying. Right. And um, and so, so it's always like a second cultural competency for me. Um, I feel really comfortable in in China and Taiwan and kind of Chinese spaces, but. But I still, you know, feel those differences, and and I guess um, that's kind of like part of the conundrum of being an Asian American who studies China, is that you know people in China expect you to be, you know, because of the way you look, they expect you to be native and they expect you to understand everything, and um, and then people in the United States, you know, assume that you're also, you know, you're so in touch with your Chinese culture, uh, but but actually, those kind of cultural boundaries that you have to cross become they, they seem even more um significant when when it seems obvious to everyone else that they should be easy for you but they're not easy does that make sense so yes. like when everyone assumes that, that like there's no boundary to cross then then actually the boundaries can seem bigger and you become more conscious of them so so for me um i i don't you know, I've, I've lived in a lot of different places and, and I have seen, you know, how culture shapes how people think about, you know, parenting or about uh, the best things to eat or, you know, what's the most desirable way to be educated or whatever. Um, but I guess what, what's happened, I guess, in, in the course of my life is I've become just really conscious of how, how hard it is to, to master culture and how in basically every situation I've been in, um, I'm never, never the one who has it all together or who, who kind of feels completely like, like they know what to do. Interesting. Charles, what about you? So uh, to go back to where we, we were, my parents were very concerned that if we became involved with the, the church that we would lose our, our uh, Japanese heritage. At the same time, though, they, they forbade us from uh, learning Japanese. So there was a tension. On the one hand, they, they wanted a, us to be real Americans, some sort of monolingual Americans. <laughs> and on the other hand, they wanted us not to lose our connection with Japan. So that didn't make any sense at all. 
What um, was the language thing because of their experience in the war? I think so. You know, I mean, why did they end up in prison? Well, it's because they spoke Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it turned out that because we did get involved with the church, it only made our connections with Japan um, clearer and stronger. You know, we, we ended up going on missions. We ended up learning Japanese. I ended up, you know, spending my life um, studying Japanese culture. So it, it had the exactly the opposite uh, effect that my parents thought it would. And, so and as, you, as you did that, as, as your life, both in the church and professionally brought you closer and deeper into Japanese culture, was that something that your parents were apprehensive of? Again, coming out of their own experience, it would make a lot of sense. Uh, or was that something they took pride in? Well, that's a great question. I think they actually were relieved and 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 proud that I I did learn Japanese. I um, I wish that my grandfather had the same opinion. You know, one one of the reasons I learned Japanese in the first place was because when I got to BYU and could study, you know, Japanese from Beeman Sensei, I. Uh, I wanted to go home and have a conversation with my grandfather who had been my babysitter for, for all those years. And we had never really talked, you know, we had a pretty silent relationship. Um, and, you know, for many, many hours, I would sit there next to him and look at him with his eyes closed, um, thinking about something. And I wanted to know, you know, what it was exactly that he was thinking about all the time. People told me he was asleep, but I could tell he wasn't sleeping. You know, he was, he was thinking about something and I wanted to know what it was. And so when I went back for Christmas break, having studied a semester of Japanese and I, you know, went up to him and I said, you know, Oji-shan, o genki desu ka, or whenever I, how are you doing? And he wouldn't answer. <laughs> so I changed, you know, I didn't have many things I could say, but I, I pretty much tried out everything I had and he never answered. He refused to answer. And, and I guess it's because he was just used to, you know, his grandson, his good for nothing grandson, not knowing Japanese or whatever, but I went on my mission and, and I, as I'm learning his language, studying in his country, living there, he, he, he passes away. So when I come home, I've lost the opportunity to really ever have a talk with him. And so I decided that I would study his life and I did research and, and to my great surprise, one of the things I, under, I learned about him was that he spoke English fluently. Yeah, he, he was, in fact, he was famous for speaking English. And the people in the Bay Area had problems with the, uh, you know, with the white people. They would come to him, and he would, he would go with them to be their voice. But when they put his family in in a prison camp, you know, they made him, made, they made them live in this horse stall in Santa Anita racetrack. He he vowed that he would never speak English again, and he didn't. He never spoke English to me at least and um that silence you know rings in my it rings in my mind so much and I, I spent so much of my time thinking about what it is i'm going to what it is that he was thinking about because you know he he in his mind had a secret that that we that melissa you know and i needed to know wow and Boy, his, um, even as you, as you tell that, I mean, his <clears throat> silence, um, what a profound critique of what this country did to uh, him and, and, uh, and your family and so many other families uh, like them. Um, well, thanks for sharing that, that, that bit of personal background. Why, why don't we dive into the, into the books a little bit? Um, 
uh, or, or a lot as much as we can. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that th they're the, both of these books just contain multitudes. I mean, I, I think they um, are, you know, the best of, of you know, what, what we hope for in a, in a memoir. Uh, in the sense of just capturing the the whole range of human experience, so there's there's a lot of joy in in these books. There's a lot of humor in these books. I laughed out loud uh, several times. Uh, there's a lot that is transparently faith promoting. These 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 are books uh, for Latter Day Saints, and I think people will find a lot of value in them. But but they're books that are bigger than Latter Day Saints and the Latter Day Saint experience. That are really about the human experience. And, and so because of that, both of you talk about a lot of hard issues, um, which again, transcend Mormonism. Uh, you talk about racism, uh, partly what we were just talking about. You talk about sickness and divorce and death. Uh, I mean, Melissa, you've got death and cancer right in, in, in your title, right? So, so you're not hiding anything uh, from anyone. Um, can you talk about just the process of writing this, these books and, and your decision to maybe where these books came from, but also your decision to open up and, and be so uh, open, so vulnerable about so many parts of your life that uh, I think I think a lot of people would, would maybe keep in and, and, and keep private. Uh, Charles? Hmm. Let, let's let Melissa go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's the one who mentioned death and cancer in the title, so we should let her own it. Well, I guess um, for me, it was obviously, um, it was an existential crisis, like, like a, a literal existential crisis. I wasn't sure if I would live for more than a year at that time. And so... Um, and this is 2017? Uh, yes. So I was yeah. diagnosed in the spring of 2017. Uh huh. But then, didn't yeah. So um, it's all kind of running together in my mind. But basically, I wasn't sure um, how long I was going to live, and my kids were quite young, and I wasn't sure if they would ever know what I thought about kind of complicated issues because at this point we were still in the age of, you know, the hair trigger tantrums and the. Um, pretty simple conversations about ice cream. You know, do you want some or do you not want ice cream? So, so I, I, you know, just thought, what could I do to throw all of my stuff together? And my really good friend from college, um, she and her daughter put together a website where they kind of amalgamated some stuff that I wrote, and um, and they also insisted that I inc they include the uh, my my family holiday letters in the website. I'm like, well, that's really weird. Why do you want the letters? I'm like, oh, we love the letters. <laughs> and so then, um, so then I thought, hey, this is kind of like a lot of stuff. Um, and maybe if to keep to save them them from having to, you know, pay a domain hosting fee for the rest of, you know, however long, um, maybe I could just throw it into a book, and then that would be my kind of instead of food storage, my kind of thought storage, right. and then I could just leave that for my kids. Yeah, and but but it's it's one thing. I mean, a lot of people write personal histories or write letters to their kids. You know, maybe especially in these existential moments. But it, we also have a great tradition of this in our community of of people doing this to leave a legacy for their children. Often, when they get older, you were faced with it much earlier. Um, but there's a, you know, that the, there's a bit of a leap from doing that just for your kids to saying I'm going to publish this for the world or for anybody who's interested? What, uh, was it friends and family who prevailed upon you to do that? Or what, what made you think this was about? Well, for, for more actually this is like really weird to say, but I'm a really forgetful person. And I'm sure my kids, have, they've inherited the kind of same forgetfulness. And you know, like we have like these family reunion books where, where we have these family histories and they're in these little binders that get carried around in boxes. And I thought, you know, someone's gonna lose these. If I make my kids a binder, of all my thoughts, they're going to lose them. But if I like make a book out of it, they can always just buy it again on Amazon. So <laughs> that makes it real. It'll be there forever, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Charles, what about you? Okay. So, you know, strangely, I, when you ask that question, my honest answer is that I'm not really sure. 
where this book came from or why I wrote it. But I, I do know that um, when I was uh, giving this talk at the church history department a couple of weeks back and sitting down and thinking about the book, um, it occurred to me at that point that, that the reason I was doing my book was the reason I had done so many things you know, in my life, which is because I was responding to what we call the spirit of Elijah. I remember being very moved by uh, 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 Brother Irene's talk when he, when he received the impression that he should write down the, the moments when the spirit made a impression on him. And, and I felt like my, Melissa, maybe I, I felt bad because I had not been a good, good diary keeper. I guess, did, did you keep a diary, Melissa? Oh, I did, but um, as is the case with most diaries, when women get married, they stop keeping them. So, yeah. yes. so I was really I bad too. at that. Yeah. <laughs> so my book is a kind of uh, a way to capture what would have gotten lost, and and I think a lot of my experience was probably well, it certainly was valuable for me, but I could see that it could be valuable for others because. Um, you know, I have made every mistake in the book. I can't, I can't uh, emphasize more the, the, the numbers of times that I have gone astray in my lifetime. And, but strangely enough, even though I have wandered and I have had, you know, many times of doubt and, you know, I've thrown in the towel a few times, I'm still pretty much in the game. And to me, that, that alone is um, a kind of impenetrable question. You know, why am I still going? And, and um, it has something to do with, again, being inspired or allowing yourself to be inspired, um, which means that, you know, a lot of the time I just, I'm not really sure exactly where I'm headed. I'm not really sure where I, what I'm doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, this book kind there, of- There's no was, master plan. All right. Right. The, the book was really easy to write for me, you know, I have to say. And I, and people ask me about the structure and, you know, all this stuff. And, and I have really no, uh, I really had no plan that it be written in any particular way. I just started and I just wrote it. it. It's interesting you say that because it um, it reads effortlessly. Not and, and and I know that it's it's not effortless, right? Uh, writing is hard work. Um, e even if it comes easy, it's still hard to do. But it but 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 it reads like it it just kind of flowed uh, out of you. So it's interesting to hear you say that. So you know, I'm interested in in both of your books. There there, there are. I think important differences between your books, but I, I think I, I see a lot of similar things. And I don't know if this is because your family or you just see the, the world in similar ways or, um, but one of the things that, that is so clear in both books and, I, and striking, I think, is you have such a keen attention to, to the body and to the senses, to the way that religion is is not just a kind of intellectual thing, but it's a bodily thing. It's a physical thing. And I just want to read a couple of passages from your book. So from Melissa's book, the feeling of the Costa Mesa wards, you, you grew up in Orange County, uh, right? So, so the Costa Mesa ward, the feeling of the Costa Mesa wards metal folding chairs is part of my body's long-term memory. I can feel their cold smoothness against my back from slumping during Sunday school or mutual activities or early morning seminary. I know the exact weight of two chairs in each hand in the hustle and bustle of clearing away a ward social. That is such, uh, I mean, for, for me, that just evoked <laughs> so many things. Uh, and, then, and then Charles, uh, this, this, this beautiful line, the smell of Mormonism is the aroma of baked goods. 
the smell of Buddhism is the scent of smoldering sandalwood. And, and I can tell, I mean, both of those smells are, are still very present uh, for you. So, I mean, so you both really make powerful arguments, sometimes in the form of, a mar of an argument, sometimes just in, in the form of storytelling, uh, that religion is lived in the body, not just in the mind. Um, do you mind talking a little bit more about that, about what, what you mean by that? Okay, so I guess I should go. <laughs> um, so you know, I I I am an um, someone who is has studied the modern period very intensely for a very long time because I wanted to I wanted to understand what it what modern consciousness is and how it developed and to make a very long story short. <clears throat> what happens as we move into the modern period is we, we go from a sense of locale to a sense of location, or we go from a sense of place to a sense of space. And, and the difference is that um, we go from something concrete and physical to something less concrete and conceptual or uh, ideological. So there's, there's something very concept oriented about modern consciousness and, and modern culture. And, and I feel like, I feel like our, our faith uh, was from the start uh, a response to a modern predicament. Joseph Smith hears all these people uh, they're competing for his attention and he goes into the woods and he, he asks a very modern question, which is of these religions, which is the true religion? Uh, <clears throat> but the answer that he gets is a, a, a strikingly material, strikingly uh, what I call below the line experience where he sees physical people, visible, physical people who address him in a personal way and they're actually talking to him. And, and that experience is from a modern point of view, totally, totally out of bounds, right? Totally unacceptable. No positivist would accept the, the, the experience of Joseph Smith, right? So, but curiously, you know, and, and maybe you and I have to have this fight publicly to settle it, but um, a, a lot of us growing up in the, the end of the modern period, um, think of ourselves as modern people. And, and we, we have modern habits, including the habits of racism, sexism, and so on. Um, but my, my simple-headed understanding of Joseph Smith is that what he started was <clears throat> not, a, not another reformation, a modern reformation of a concept, but uh, a kind of postmodern restoration of before modern, relationships between people and, and the gods, people and things and so on. So, so I have a very kind of a maybe philosophically driven uh, notion of thingness, but I'm also a farmer, you know, I grew up on a farm. You know, I grew up weeding, weeding sugar beets and, and uh, uh, filling semi-trucks full of potato, sacks of potatoes. That was my life. I was I was intending to be a farmer, in fact, until I got to BYU and I started writing papers. And, and uh, my brother Dwight, he came up to me one day and he said, you know, Charles, you really surprised us because we thought that you were kind of hopeless, you know, that you were gonna become a, you know, a, a rock star or a farmer or something like that. And, and, and you've been studying so hard and it's too bad it doesn't last longer than it does. And I said, what do you mean by that? He says, well, 
come on, you're not going to be writing papers all your life. It's just something you do for a couple of years in college because you have to, but then you get over it and you move on with your life. And I thought, maybe, maybe I don't want to stop writing papers. <laughs> So I went back to my dad and I told him, I broke his heart. And I says, you know, daddy, I, I think maybe I'm not going to be a farmer like we planned. And so, you know, he let me, he was wise enough to let me do what I wanted to do. But my point is that my being my father's son meant that I was pretty thing oriented, yeah. pretty concrete. And I think that that's a kind of a part of the Noe tradition. You know, we like to go hiking, we like to go fishing, we like to go hunting and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and it, one of the things, you know, to finally get to the conclusion of my, my rambling is one of the things that I think is meant to be restored is our, our relationship with locale, our relationship with place, our relationship with with things, because you know, um, you know, Heidegger said it. You know, we we modern people tend to have a very instrumental view of reality, and everything becomes a tool for their use. And if they're not useful, then you know, we don't think about them, and we 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 lose the poetic aspects of technology. He says technology is about making something come forward, come appear. You know to us, to be with us. And I think that, I think that um, Joseph Smith had a few things to say about our relationship with, with things, you know? He didn't come right out and say, you know, we're animists. Right. But I think there's something there, you know, that needs to be explored. Brother Hanley has already explored it, I see. Yes, yeah. yeah, George Hanley uh, has been terrific, yeah. <clears throat> Alyssa, what about you? Where does this bodily religion come from for you? Um, well, both on my Japanese side and my Chinese side, my my grandparents were farmers as well. So um, I think for for me, um, like life was full of work, not not the same level as Uncle Charles's hard work, of course, but um, to the extent that you can work uh, in suburban Orange County, we did a lot of work, and um, and also we ate a lot of really good food and we cooked really good food. And when we celebrated, um, it kind of centered around preparing food and making food. So, so for me, I think um, like physical work just seems so much more substantial in my, in my mind compared to idea work. Like, yes, yeah, it's, it's like easy to say, like, like the haiku that is in Uncle Charles's book, right? Like it's easy to say unity, love, justice, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but like it's way harder to make someone dinner and take it to their house like it's just a lot of work to to do stuff and and so I, I think I I respect like the the space and the the time and the value and the resources that that work takes up and and you know Mormonism is a religion of work yeah well that's that's a great transition. I, Charles, one of the really um, important and central images in your book uh, that recurs throughout is the, uh, this image of raking. And here, here's a quote. Uh, I, I could have chose one of several, but, but this one, life is short. There's no time to waste. Constant raking. No missing class. Wash the dishes, sweep the floor, rake, rake, rake. To feel happiness, do a simple thing the right way. Do it now. So, so tell us that this concept of raking comes from a very specific, uh, you know, a place. Can you maybe explain that for for people listening, and then, and then talk about how how you apply that uh, more broadly than than its its original uh, usage. <laughs> So every once in a while, one of my students misses class and they, and they ask me, oh, Professor Inouye, did I miss anything important? And I always say, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're just wasting time. Here. <laughs> yeah. What I'm thinking in my head is, you bonehead, of course you missed something important. Why would we have class? 
if it wasn't important. <laughs> so, um, but the deal is, you know, the the Zen Garden is is a is a high maintenance kind of thing. You know, you you wouldn't you wouldn't make a garden out of sand or gravel that needs to be raked constantly if you didn't <clears throat> appreciate um, just the idea of, of work, the idea of, of thingness, the idea of, of just doing the same thing well again and again and again. And I think that uh, like the Zen tradition, the Zen tradition is of all the sects of Mahayana Buddhism, the, the most Japanese because it learned the most from animism. It, it pushed these concepts, very, you know, very dizzyingly, you know, abstract concepts of Buddhism into the concrete reality of flower arrangement, uh, judo, martial arts, and and it, and it and it made it possible for us to realize that our enlightenment, our spiritual uh, refinement comes from simple physical acts that we can do right like like uh, like making bread for example and i think our tradition it has that same impulse you know we're we're kind of <clears throat> because we believe in personal gods you know and having a personal relationship with with the gods it kind of doesn't make sense to write theology you know, it, it makes more sense to write memoirs, you know, to, to write about our personal experiences when, you know, we, we walked together and we had, we had moments of, of conversation and so on. Um, and so, you know, would you write a, if you were to write about your father, would you write, you know, about the nature of my father? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you would write about the times that you did things together that, were meaningful, right? And I, and I think that that's a part of the raking impulse. You know, the the idea in Zen is you don't want to get to positive two because if you climb up to two, you're going to fall back down to negative two. Uh, so what you want to do is 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 just get to zero, get to a state of equilibrium, a state of peace, a state of full attention mindfulness and and you just want to stay there you just want to maintain that you know from a certain point of view that boring regu regularity but that boring regularity is is the source of of so much of our insight right yeah and and, and, and your book is full of those those kinds of stories uh i mean you say at one point I mean, you, you 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 talk about um uh, home teaching and visiting this 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 family who had been through a, a family trauma that the father died is, is that right right, right. The and dude, just yeah. that that you sort of discovered <clears throat> uh, so so much of your Christianity in the the, the doing of, of that right. not not thinking about it but 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 doing doing it so. yeah absolutely um, Melissa you um I mean, you, you, you talked about the part of what you wanted to do here was to, to be able to communicate how you think about complex things uh, to, uh, to, to your children who weren't yet ready to, to think about complex things. And, and fortunately, you then shared it with the rest of us. And one of the things, one of those complex things you talked about is, is just how human this thing that we call religion is. And, and I love this passage where you say, flawed human elements are an integral part of all major religious movements. One does not simply pluck a Torah off a tree or peel a fresh picked communion. Such a great image. The maintenance of any distinctive tradition involves hardware, assembly lines, and the work of many human hands. It is the humanness of the project that is both most problematic and most inspiring. And I, I suspect that a lot of people think about religion in a rather different way, right? They, they, they think about um, maybe the Torah not being plucked right off the tree, but, uh, you know, transmitted somehow directly onto tablets of stone 
uh, or onto you know uh, plates of gold or or something like that. So, can you talk about the the, the humanness of of religion? You say it's both problem problematic and and inspiring. You 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 talk a lot about both sides of that coin. Well, the the thing is, the people are the worst. It's just horrible, um, as we know from. I don't know, living in modern society or seeing what, what happens in the news. But um, at the same time, you know how there's that passage in the gospels where Jesus looks at the rich young man and beholding him loves him. And I remember um, as a missionary, uh, kind of towards the end of my mission, when I feel like I finally figured out what I was supposed to be doing. I really did. I, could, I would look at people and I would love them. Yeah. And it was incredible. And it was, as I, as I think I wrote in my book, um, like a superpower, like a miracle, like a fountain of living water. And, um, and so, so we have this, you know, potential within us um, to, be, to be godly, to be divine and to be, you know, so, so amazing. So when, when I think about, um, Like I, I think about what helps a community stay together over time. You know, what, what keeps a, a religious tra tradition like Judaism hanging together over thousands and thousands of years. So much work, so much involvement, so much study, so much kind of sharing of common things like the texts, the stories and the Passover meals and the things that you do on the Sabbath, you know, and, and the same thing about Mormonism, you know, it's, even though we're, we're a tiny, super young faith, as far as faith is concerned, you know, what has held us together for, you know, oh, well, almost not even, oh, wait, wait, I guess if it, by certain measures, yes, we, we are 200 years, if you count back to the first vision. So, um, you know, for 200 years, you can barely say hundreds of years now. Um, you know, I think, I think, again, like those investments of, of human relationships and connections and people just being together in the same place, that's not nothing. That's significant. That takes a lot of energy and it just doesn't happen by itself. You know, any, any parent, um, teacher, anyone who tries to organize an activity knows that like organized human activities don't just happen by themselves. People have to want to do them. There has to be a compelling reason for doing them. Um, and it's really significant in my mind. So, so but I love what people can do but together. But as you talk about it, um, as well. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of that organized human activity, that people aren't just bringing the good, but they're bringing the, all the wrong <laughs> parts of them too. Yeah, no, it's bad. <laughs> and that's, uh, and, and, and you do, we don't have time to talk about all of it here. So again, uh, uh, listeners go check out the book, but I mean, you, you know, you do a lot of hard work thinking through how you live through these conundrums and live in these conundrums and, and maybe don't even sort it all out. Uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of living in it. Um, well, as, as, as we, uh, draw towards the close here, I've got a couple more questions, uh, for you. There's lots more we could talk about, but but I want to talk about, um, you know, both of the titles of your books, uh, Zion, Earth, Zen, Sky, and Crossings. They, they, uh, and, and then we see this as you get into the books. I mean, there's a serious engagement here with other religious and cultural traditions. There's, there's a kind of openness. There's a kind of conversation, even a kind of permeability. Um, and again, a lot of people I think sometimes feel at least mildly threatened uh, by that. We, we know uh, not just in our church, but in most organized religions, uh, people have spent a lot of time and effort trying to stamp out any type of crossings uh, or any time of what, what's oftentimes called syncretism. Um, what do you gain? What, what does a person gain from opening themselves up to religious and cultural and intellectual traditions that are not native to them. Uh, what do these crossings give us? Melissa, do you want to start? Um, sure. So if you think about, you know, if you believe the basic idea that people are children of God, 
that means that like at any given time on the earth, there's, you know, like about 7 billion people and like you're one billionth of God's children. So, 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 and if God has like, if all the children are, are, you know, all full children of God, that means that like my personal experience is like one seven billionth of what it means to be divine, right? Like to be a divine being, I'm one seven billionth, like my, my experience. So then um, like, like Americans, for example, are 6% of the world's population. So like, if we were to only pursue like, you know, truth, justice, and, and, you know, love within an American context, within things that only made sense to like, you know, Americans, just as an example, we would only be, you know, living like 6% of, of a divine life. So that would be like, um, like if you compare that to the body weight of, on like my finger, that'd be like living my whole life in like, in my hand or something like that. Um, so just, just from that point of view, I think um, we need to get out of our existing cultural understandings and understand what it means to be a child of God. Because um, if we have the, f the fewer kind of cultural paradigms we live in, the less we understand that. Yeah, Charles. Um. Well, culture is a is a super complicated thing, right? And and there and there are two things I want to say about your question. One is uh, there are a lot of things about our culture, broadly understood, that that come from other cultures, and they actually. I think obscure the truth of what we're trying to understand. For instance, um, <clears throat> the when Aristotle thought about how to account for the world, he he came up with this idea of the 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 prime mover that is perfect in the sense that it's the original, it's the first thing that moves and sets everything else into motion. Um, but the problem with that model is that it it makes it makes God so far, so far from us, so distant, so so inhuman, so so hard to understand. That when Augustine and others, you know, come out come onto the idea and they try to incorporate it into their understanding of of Christianity, it it becomes a, a kind of um, a weight that we struggle with even now, you know, because it's a misunderstanding of the way that God is actually, you know, personal. So in the same way, you could, <clears throat> the great thing about studying other cultures is that sometimes you come on to these ways that other people have, have, have thought up of understanding things that are very helpful for your own understanding of, of your faith. For example, um, so I, I, I have, you know, I just wrote down this morning five things that I could talk about. One is Mahayana Buddhism uh, and, the, and the cycle of life. Uh, for me, that knowing that was very helpful in, when I wrote my book about the end of the world because it made clear the relationship between uh, justice and compassion, which is which is talked about and, and taught many, many times within our tradition. But there was something about the Buddhist way of seeing it that made it clearer to me. Another one is, um, you know, Zen and, and, and how it's, it's focus on mindfulness and concentration and meditation. It's 12 o'clock. Can also be a, a great help for us. Um, when we're talking about, uh, the proclamation on the family and reading that how to read that proclamation and it's to us some somewhat problematic ideas of gender if we if we could borrow the Taoist notions of of what they call g extremes and wu g uh, lack of extreme applying that model to that text is actually one way to understand it in a way that is extremely extremely helpful we talked about animism already, 
how that would that could help us understand about our our relationship with with the earth and with our creator we could talk about confucianism and how that might help us appreciate our family more be be more willing to you know take care of our or elderly and so on so all these things are out there for our for our benefit i think you know and and studying them is 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 not uh not a bad idea. I, I can understand why people are threatened because it changes the way you understand something. But you know, if that change is moving in a good direction, I think that it's it's not a bad strategy. And, and um, thanks for elaborating all those specific things. I uh, I think especially uh, so many Latter Day Saints are so rooted culturally, geographically. Um, <clears throat> uh intellectually in the west or in the euro-american tradition um that when we think about learning from other religions it's uh and traditions it's from very close cousins like methodism <laughs> right or catholicism uh or, or or something like that uh maybe judaism or something like that uh and i i think i'd wager to say that that the deep <laughs> wisdom uh, that, that, that we find on the Asian continent uh, in its multiplicity of traditions is still quite foreign uh, to, to, to most Latter-day Saints. I, I think we've uh, hardly even begun to, to have those conversations and there's so, so much to learn um, from, from these traditions that, that didn't stem from Augustine in, in one way or another, right? Um, okay, my last question. Uh, and uh, this is not necessarily meant to be a testimony meeting, but, but I'm, I, I think one of the most striking um, sentences in Melissa's book is a quote from you, uh, Charles. <laughs> and, uh, and she quotes you, as, and you can, you can correct it. Maybe she misquoted you, and you can, for the public record, say here that she got it horribly wrong. But, uh, but she quotes you as saying, there are a lot of stories in the world, but the Mormon story is the one that I want to be true. To the extent that it is not, I will make it true. So Charles, maybe we'll give you the first chance to, to say what you meant by that. And then Melissa, what does it mean to you to have heard your uncle Charles say that so i when i was at stanford i had a a moment when i thought that that if i'm going to be a good person i should be an honest person and an honest person is um clear-headed about what he or she uh, believes and doesn't believe and can and thinks and doesn't think so i took my questions to uh one of the members of the bishopric who was a, an anthropologist at Stanford. And, and he, he patiently listened to my, uh, my, uh, my questions. And then he said to me, well, you know, there, there are many stories in the world, but, but all stories are not the same. There, there are some stories that you, you actually want to be true. And to the extent that, um, they they aren't true you know you you try to live a life in a way that makes those stories true and and i think that uh that was very helpful to me because it it made me realize that that um first of all there are many there are many stories out there there, there are zillions of stories out there but wanting a particular story to be true is is um, a kind of reading of stories that is very different from even what i do as a scholar of literature right it's 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 not the same because the story that says uh we are children of god we have this divine nature we can have experiences that make us <clears throat> Uh, purify ourselves and and bring out this potential in us so that someday we you know we progress 
and we meet the people we we love before that that story is among among all stories a different kind of story and i think admitting that is a that it is different is the beginning and then the next step is to say well why is it different how is it different and and i think one of the ways that what the story of our faith is different is that you know, it requires us to rake. It requires us to to go through the motions that uh, give us the experiences that are that affirm the truth of the moment, which is the truth of the narrative. I think they're they're two different things. You know, there's there's the narrative, the plotted part of our lives, but there are the the lyrical moments of our lives as well. And I think the narrative catches those moments it, it arranges those moments in a way that makes a larger story possible so that's kind of what i mean i mean you know uh, you can have you can have true experiences basically and 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 those true experiences are largely possible because of the way they fit into this larger narrative just building on that idea of true experiences, I think, um, you know, when I was, uh, and now I know he, he, he was quoting it from someone else, so I was not just quoting it. You know, it's, it's like a long standing quote and possibly misquote. Maybe it goes back. Um, so, so when I was having these issues as well uh, as a university student, and actually, I, 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 this is not only in the past, whenever I have um, whenever I feel like it's super problematic that the kinds of um, tenets and uh, propositions um, of our faith um, are, are somehow <coughs> in contradiction with each other, um, then in the past, I, or, or at times, I feel like this is super problematic. Maybe it's a deal breaker. Maybe there's nothing that can be done with these, with these contradictions. Um, maybe there's no point. But then I usually um, think about it in a slightly different way, which is I think that um, experiences of the truth are more reliable than, than declarations of the truth or evaluations of the truth. And I feel like relationships are more reliable than platforms of doctrines or ideas. And in terms of what does God want us to do where is God and where is truth? And so from that point of view, um, this, this question of to the extent that it is not, I will make it true, uh, depends on you know, what we do, what kinds of experiences we have, who we have them with, what kinds of relationships we build. That to me is the core of where truth can be found in the restored gospel. Because as a historian, if you look at the history of our doctrines, our policies, our practices, the constant is change. Um, what seems the most eternal and enduring to me and also the most authentic and real are the relationships that we form and the, the love that we feel for each other, not just fellow Latter-day Saints, but the love that we feel because of our understanding that we're all children of God and that we have a divine identity and purpose. Beautiful. Thank you. That's a great place to end. So um, I'm grateful for, for this time that, that we've had to, to spend together. And, and again, listeners or, or people watching this, uh, again, just to remind you, so, so the books are Zion, Earth, Zen, Sky uh, by Charles Inouye and uh, Crossings. I won't read the whole long subtitle again. Uh, sorry, Melissa, uh, but it's, it's brilliant and delightful. Uh, uh, both published by the, the Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship uh, in, in the last couple of years, and both well worth your time. Um, so again, thanks to both of you for joining us. Thanks to the, to the staff of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences that, that makes this possible and supports the FOIA. And thanks to, to each of you for listening. Uh, Charles and Melissa, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And goodbye. Bye-bye.